And today it is my distinct honor and pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Masa, uh, Masashi Nishihara. And uh, we are also uh, indebted to the uh, Consul General of uh, Japan in Detroit's office, and Chashiro san is here to represent the office. Uh, and, and they would like us to fill out this uh, survey after the uh, presentation, after the lecture. So if you could take the time to uh, fill out this survey, that would be great. Um, Dr. Masashi Nishihara is uh, the president of the Research Institute for Peace and Security in Japan, and he is a uh, foremost expert on Japan's foreign policy issues uh, and national security uh, issues. And he was um, the president of the National Defense Academy, which uh, in Japan is a uh, uh, it, it's, it's like combining all the military academies in the U.S. into one place, and that's uh, the National Defense Academy. Uh, it exists in Yokosuka, and he has he had been president of that uh, academy for six years, and um, he has advised a uh, published widely in different uh, uh, journals and and books, and he has also advised a number of past and current administrations about in Japan about it, uh, their foreign affairs, um, advising Prime Minister Junjiro Koizumi and, my, and also advising Prime Minister uh, Abe, uh, the current resident of the Prime Minister's house. Uh, whether he listens to Dr. Nishihara or anybody or not, uh, that's something that he will talk about today. Uh, for, I don't know, for, the, for us, the most important thing is that he, this is a homecoming for him. He is a uh, um, alum, finishing his uh, master's degree and PhD degree in political science uh, in oh some some decades ago. But, uh, <laughs> so it's a uh, great uh, <laughs> great to have him back here, and uh, he is here to talk about Japan's current foreign policy uh, environment. And the title of his talk is "Japanese Responses to the U.S.-China Cold War." Very timely, uh, as President Trump is about to visit. Uh, have a meeting with North Korea, and then Hanoi, there was a yeah. talk of a meeting with Xi Jinping, but may, that may or may not happen. Anyway, he will talk about all that, and uh, without any other further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Nishihara. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Tsui. Uh, I'm very glad to be invited here. Uh, as he said, I'm here at the invitation of Japanese uh, Council General in in, uh, uh, in Detroit and also at the Center for Japanese Studies here. I, you'd, I was a graduate student uh, here. Uh, he said, Professor Sui said several decades ago, I should be a little more precise, five decades ago, 50 <laughs> years ago. Uh, last year, uh, I, I, I met my wife here and uh, last year, that was the 50th anniversary for me. Uh, I can see it's a quite long period uh, since I left uh, Michigan. Uh, at that time, there was no building like this, like this and the uh, building was, uh, I think the scenery has changed. I'm surprised that I came here. Uh, I was here for about six years uh, doing my MA and PhD work. Uh, I had a small study room at uh, Lane Hall. Uh, I don't know if uh, people here are familiar with that, uh, uh, Lane Hall. Uh, that was the center for many area studies as, uh, 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 at that time. A uh, few years ago, I was also invited here uh, as a uh, uh, so lecturer uh, by the Center for Japanese Studies. So I'm very happy to be back here. Uh, today, I would like to talk about uh, the, how Japan is responding to the U.S.-China Cold War and its, its implications for Japanese uh, security and Japan's alliance with the United States. I'd like to begin with the uh, uh, begin with from Prime Minister Abe uh, and the subsequent issues, uh, Mr. Abe. Uh, was an uh, interesting political leader in many ways. Uh, it's a big contrast uh, uh, to, to the uh, 
American leader, who is the President uh, uh, Trump. Mr. Abe was brought up in a family of uh, three generations of politicians. It's uh, quite different from Mr. Trump. Uh, Mr. Abe's father was a foreign minister and was considered to become a prime minister if he survives uh, for a few more years, but he got, had to pass away uh, because of his sickness. Uh, Abe's grandfather on his mother's side uh, was the Prime Minister Nobusuke Kishi, who was the Prime Minister during the 1960s. Uh, he was responsible for concluding the Japan US Security Treaty in 1960. Kishi actually had a younger brother as well, Eisak Sato, who became also a Prime Minister. So it's, uh, Abe has been surrounded by the, many of the uh, very prominent political leaders in Japan. Abe has started his political life where he worked as a staff member. He then became a member of the uh, National Diet. He served as a minister, a minister of Postal Service and also served as a Chief Cabinet Secretary. That's about all he had uh, in terms of political experiences. Then he became a political uh, Prime Minister. But he was elected a total of nine times so far. Therefore, he has had a long career uh, in the diet, national diet. Uh, he is now uh, serving uh, as a prime minister, serving for the seventh year. Uh, this is quite unusual uh, by Japanese standard. Uh, many of the Japanese prime ministers are very short-lived. Uh, two years, three years, sometimes half a year. Uh, Japan's longest serving prime minister was Taro uh, Katsura. He was a prime minister many years ago, over 100 years ago. Uh, he was responsible for concluding Anglo-Japanese alliance in 1902, the Russo-Japanese war in 1905, and Japan-Korea annexation treaty in 1910. Uh, so he did, uh, he ser served uh, uh, Prime Minister for about 7.8 months back, back in 1900, early 1900. Uh, Abe's current tenure ends in September 2021, next uh, two years from now. But if he survives, he will beat uh, Prime Minister uh, Katsura after September this, this year. Uh, so it's coming pretty soon. Uh, he's been a very energetic uh, political leader, Prime Minister as well. He does not seem to mind taking, uh, taking up all his trips. Since he came into office, he has uh, so far made 81 foreign travels, uh, visiting 78 countries. He has met Putin, for example, for as many as 25 times. I don't know why he wants to meet him so often. But anyway, he had a record. Uh, uh, why he, d he makes such uh, so many trips, but he has a, a he would like to see an uh, upgrade the international status of Japan. That's a major concern. Uh, but at this time, when he meets Prime Minister Putin, he has his own political agenda, territorial issues, and also he wants to drive some kind of wedge between Russia and China. That's a very interesting uh, try and see whether he will succeed. Uh, we have to see. Uh, Prime Minister Abe has also made major speeches in different places, including the US uh, Congress and Australian Parliament and so on and so forth. Uh, in, the, in terms of G7, uh, after uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel, he's the oldest, he's the oldest member in G7. Uh, he will be hosting the G7 summit this year. Uh, uh, by this time, his status has really gone up for international uh, uh, circles. Uh, therefore, when he speaks something on the international issues, he is being listened, listened to. 
uh, compared with other prime ministers in the past. For example, Prime Minister Trump decided, uh, President Trump decided to take up the U.S. out of TPP in 2017. Many people thought TPP would die, but Abe came out to give a strong support to TPP without the United States. And TPP in that sense started uh, last year, December. It will soon be joined by other countries like Thailand, uh, Colombia, uh, Indonesia, Taiwan, maybe, and UK. Uh, so he has had some influence uh, on the international scene uh, to improve and uh, promote his uh, diplomacy. Uh, Mr. Abe has also influenced uh, President Trump, at least on one foreign policy issue. Abe first used the concept of free and open uh, Indo-Pacific initiatives. Uh, Mr. Trump also uses the term, but originally he was influenced by Mr. Abe. Uh, in 2016, Abe uh, made a speech on the concept of Indo-Pacific, a free and open Indo-Pacific, in the Japanese African Conference in Nairobi back in 2016. He then talked to Mr. Trump to, in Tokyo in 2017, and then Mr. Trump talked about the open, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, initiatives uh, there in, in, in that, I believe, the Nan in, in Hanoi. Uh, Mr. Trump remarked on this concept as his new policy. Uh, he and Mr. Abe are frequently on the telephones. Uh, formally or informally. Therefore, it's a very close uh, relationship between the two. In fact, the close relationship on the phone, uh, on the, uh, between the two leaders are enormous asset for Japan. For example, Trump talked to, actually talked to Kim Jong-un about the abductee issue in Singapore for Mr. Abe. Uh, that's rather unusual that a, in the first meeting between Trump and uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, the president has referred to the issue that Japanese are concerned about. I should also say that he is the only foreign leader with whom uh, President Trump is willing to play golf. I don't know why either. Uh, maybe Mr. Abe is not so strong a player uh, Mr. President feels comfortable uh, playing with uh, Mr. Abe. But anyway, uh, that's the only uh, partner that the President Trump likes to play golf with. He has, Abe has also recommended recently President Trump as Nobel, Prize, Prize, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner this year. Uh, that may happen uh, mm -hmm. this fall. So it is interesting to see the two contrasting uh, leaders working together for the security of the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I would like to move on to the, how the two leaders uh, look at China. They do actually share their views of, on, on China. Some people would think that the uh, important cause of the Cold War between the United States and China today is a huge trade imbalance between the two countries. I do think that trade war is, a, uh, I don't think this trade war is, is really the fundamental uh, cause. The real cause, in my view, is the competition between the Americans and the Chinese systems free democratic system and authoritarian system. When the US and Soviet Union competition was over back in 1989, many people expected to see a liberal international order to prevail. Instead, we have seen the rise of authoritarian order, another authoritarian order. China made a remarkable rise uh, until 2008, however, uh, when the Olympic was game was successfully held in Beijing, 
until 2008, the Chinese used the term the peaceful rise of China. And many people outside China tend to believe it. However, it has been reported that China actually expressed the desire as early as 2003 to divide the, and the rule the Pacific between China and the United States over the Pacific. Uh, the following three decades, uh, today uh, China is going to celebrate two historically significant years, 2021 and the uh, 2049. 2021 uh, is the 100th anniversary of the birth of the Chinese Communist Party, and 2049 is the 100th anniversary of the uh, birth of the People's Republic of China. In addition, in 2025, the year from the two, uh, two ambitious uh, Made in China 2025 plan, uh, will achieve its technological targets. In order to celebrate 2021-2049, uh, they will have a completed national unification. In other words, establishing a national sovereignty over the South China Sea and annexing Taiwan and also annexing Senkaku Islands. So there are three areas in the Western Pacific that the China is aiming at uh, uh, taking uh, over uh, to make it the part of China. And that is likely to happen, in my view, before 2049. Uh, Japan and the United States has almost identical uh, perceptions of China's hegemonic economic and military policy. They watch with great care the President Xi Jinping's grand plan to sustain superiority over the U.S. in both economic and military fields. The U.S. National Defense Strategy of 2018 says, for example, quote, China wants to shape a world consistent with authoritarian model, gaining veto authority over other nations' economic and diplomatic and security decisions. It also says that, quote, today every domain is contested air land, sea, space, and cyberspace, uh, unquote. Japan's equivalent of defense document, it's called the National Defense Program Outline Guidelines, uh, says a similar tone uh, about the uh, perception of China. Quote, rapid expansion in the use of new domains, which are space, Cyberspace, electromagnetic spectrum is supposed to fundamentally change the existing paradigm of national security. Uh, other government supports, supports President Trump's efforts in preventing China from gaining an upper hand over the United States in military and technological uh, fields. Uh, United States national efforts to deter China from uh, stealing American technology are very impressive uh, from Japanese point of view. I would like to uh, move on to the how the rivalry between U.S. and China or between uh, uh, Japan and China in the Western Pacific are going on. Uh, today, we also see China's strategic competition with the United States in the Western Pacific. In order to, for China to divide the Pacific and control the Western Pacific half, it must first have full control of the area inside of the first ins uh, island chain. And I'd like to move.
there are three areas there uh, which are currently objects of conflicts between China on the one hand, uh, US and China, uh, US and Japan, rather, on the other. They are South China Sea, the Senkaku Islands, and Taiwan. The South China Sea probably presents most likelihood of armed uh, clashes between the US and Chinese. Uh, Chinese. Although Senkaku Islands and Taiwan are all no less likely to cause clashes. I'd like to show the map here. Yeah. Uh, I probably don't have to explain my here. Uh, oops. This is first island chain, and this is second island chain. Uh, what I'm saying is that the chi China uh, wants to make uh, excuse me. Oh. Inside the first island chain as an internal water, uh, we have a South China Sea, Taiwan, and the Senkaku. Senkaku is around here. Uh, China's objective is to drive the United States out of the first island chain. It is difficult to imagine that China would let those uh, disputed areas unsettled before uh, celebrating the year 2049. Uh, so in the next three decades, uh, I see that there will be a much uh, serious tensions uh, in the Western Pacific, particularly inside the first island chain. In recent months, Chinese leaders often remark more hostile and aggressive words and actions than before, which have which may suggest the imminent armed clashes inside the first island chain. Uh, in September last year, for example, the American destroyer sailing in the South China Sea was intercepted by a Chinese warship, which came so close, uh, 40 yards uh, or 45 years. Uh, to the destroyer. Uh, that happens in, in, uh, in the areas here. Vice President Mike Pence mentioned that in his speech at Hudson in October last year that we will never be, we will not be intimidated and we will not sat stand down. This is a strong expression uh, from the U.S. side, but similar uh, expressions are also uh, can hear from the uh, Chinese side as well. Uh, for example, senior colonel Dai Xu, he is the president of China's Institute of Marine Safety and Cooperation, says if the United States warships break into Chinese waters again, I suppose the two ships should be sent, one to stop it, Another one to rhyme, rhyme it. And te in territorial waters, we won't allow US ships to create disturbance. This again, as I said, there is a strong statement. We see also in, in, in other cases, for example, uh, the US chairman uh, of the Senate Armed Services Committee said January this year, that Chinese actions in South China Sea look like preparing World War III. That's also a very strong statement. Uh, similarly, Taiwan cases also uh, should be mentioned. Uh, Taiwan's straits uh, or intensifying tensions, President Trump's surprising uh, telephone call to President Tsai, uh, Tsai Ing-wei uh, uh, and soon after he became a, came into the uh, White House. And the US supply of weapons to Taiwan started uh, uh, to resume under the Taiwan Relations Act. Uh, this has probably provoked China. Defense Minister Wei Wen, uh, French, remarks uh, that repeated challenges to China's sovereignty 
over Taiwan would trigger a military response. Uh, President Xi Jinping made a speech in which uh, he stressed one nation, two systems. Uh, one nation, two systems. The whole nation will be unified, but two systems, Taiwan and mainland China, will be allied, allowed. Xi Jinping emphasized, quote, Taiwan must be and will be united with China, unquote. He then was immediately rejected by President Tsai uh, in Wei, who stressed, quote, Taiwan would never accept, unquote. On February 7th, it was reported that five Republican congressmen requested the speaker that President Tsai, Wei, Tsai Ing Wei be invited to the Congress to make a speech as a, quote, true democratic leader to fight with the oppressive government, unquote. Uh, you see the, all the very aggressive and hostile remarks from both sides. Uh, Chinese identity in the government and the people of Taiwan is becoming weaker. Uh, therefore, Chinese people apparently argue that the China should control Taiwan sooner than later. Uh, I should also mention something about the Senkaku Islands. It is under increasing Chinese uh, naval and air pressure. Number of scrambles by the Chinese fighter uh, jets, uh, fighter jets against Chinese aircraft increased from 400 in 2013 to 800, over 800 in 2017. Uh, in January last year, Chinese nuclear submarine sailed underwater and approached the islands. Um, Japanese specialists uh, tend to assume that Taiwan, uh, excuse me, PLA Navy and Air Forces will have a secret plan to invade the Senkaku Island sooner or later. Uh, we have to see. Uh, I want to show one more picture here. Uh, the ADIZ, Air Defense Identity Zone of the two countries are overlapped over Senkaku Islands. This is a, a, a way to invite conflicts in the future very easily. Uh, we are quite concerned about the, uh, when the China set up a, its own air and defense identity zone, which overlaps the Japanese. Uh, one more to this. This is the uh, picture that shows the uh, military flight route around Japan. It may be a bit difficult to see the difference in color, but this, excuse me, pardon me. Oh. Oh. Is it difficult? Uh, oh, pardon me. Uh, uh, oops. I was saying that uh, uh, different colors. The red color uh, around the Japanese islands are Russian uh, flight, uh, military flight routes. We have to scramble against those uh, uh, airplanes. Now, in this, oops, I'm not. Very good at. These are Chinese uh, military flights coming to Japan, uh, coming to Senkaku, and we scramble uh, flights uh, against the flights approaching Japan. And we are, in that sense, uh, have to spend lots of money for Japanese Air Force to, to scramble uh, against the deter. Uh, foreign ships, uh, foreign flights uh, coming closer uh, to it. Uh, finally, I should mention something about North Korea. Uh, North Korea's 
denuclearization issue is a very hot issue, but it is not likely to be resolved in a very short period. They have been developing nuclear weapons through uh, skillful, I would say, diplomacy of deception. They hide what they have done and, and so forth. Uh, first summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un in Singapore is in June last year, produced very little, although I think <laughs> uh, although the ease of tensions should be considered as a positive outcome. That was a good outcome of, of, of the Singapore summit, but this second summit, which is coming very soon, ne next week or so, uh, I'm not sure whether we will have a uh, successful, uh, big uh, outcome, good outcome uh, from there. I think it will be North Koreans are very tough in their negotiations. And uh, I hope the something good will come out, but I don't really think that is likely to be. President Trump's presidential tenure will be it will end in 2025 if he uh, runs for another uh, second term, and Kim Jong Un is not is most likely to politically survive beyond 2025 and may hold on to nuclear arsenal and missiles. In the meantime, several unexpected things may happen uh, in, in the region, including the collapse of South Korean-US alliance, Japanese-Korean tensions, and also China's relations with South Korea. United Korea uh, would have little chance to become a reality in our foreseeable future. And I'm rather inclined to see a messy North-South relations. Uh, Japan and the United States, particularly Japan, may face a messy North Northeast Asia. Uh, this would weaken the US position in the Korean Peninsula if this situation in the peninsula becomes more messy. We may see an entirely different security environment in the region. Uh, this time works. Uh, now, next topic is how Japanese uh, government uh, are responding to this uh, new environment, security environment. I make it in two parts. One is the foreign policy initiatives, and the other one is more defense uh, uh, area efforts. Uh, Japan is making a stronger alliance with the United States. Uh, as we have talked about, the uh, closer relationship between the two leaders is very helpful. Helpful. Japan is also trying to see mitigate. I put the question mark because mitigate may be a little too strong. The, when the U.S. putting big pressure on China, Japan has a slightly different reservation in going along with the U.S. Uh, for us, China is so close geographically to Japan. And also, Japanese uh, trade depends so much on 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 uh, Chinese market. But 23 or uh, three percent or so of Japanese trade is been done with the with the China. Uh, and uh, we have about 37,000 uh, companies, uh, Japanese companies, are working in the China. Uh, therefore, the relationship is very difficult. Uh, is very important and difficult for us to damage the relationship. Although we along, go along with the United States in giving sanctions and, uh, and so forth, uh, still uh, there is some hesitation on the part of Japan to, to do this. Uh, so there's a little bit of uh, uh, distance between the two countries, US and, and uh, Japan. But still, uh, uh, so there may be some new 
kind of efforts on the part of Japan uh, in this particular case. Another issue as a foreign policy initiative is a free and open Indo-Pacific initiatives. This has been uh, raised, um, uh, proposed back in 2016 by the Japanese government and the Americans. Uh, US government also follows this same idea. The two countries working together and try to balance China's uh, BRI, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, the two ideas, uh, free and open in the Pacific and also China's BRI, are not directly confronting each other, but they are competing uh, with each other. Uh, we would like to see a more open, uh, free investment activities uh, in the China's BRI uh, projects. Uh, now, to balance it, the Japan and the United States, and in fact, as I put here, a quad. Uh, what did I put? Didn't put the quad. Um, I should have put the quad. The role of quad is very important. Four quad, four countries, four democratic partners in the region: U.S., India, Japan, and Australia, are uh, working together. And I hope this will make greater success in the future. Uh, Japan ASEAN relations, Japan EU, and uh, uh, Japan UK relations are very important, and also uh, uh, not only just important. The relations between Japan and U EU. Japan and the UK are developing rather uh, remarkably today. The uh, second item of Japanese response was, uh, response was is in uh, defense efforts. Uh, I have already mentioned a little bit about it, but our government has responded very positively in, in, in terms of defense uh, in the area. Uh, first, I've mentioned several. Mm, it's in our next. Well, several things, for example. First, Japan will be introducing, deploying two aircraft carriers. That's a new development. It will probably be done in two years or three years from now. Uh, we do have a light aircraft carriers, helicopter carriers today, but government wants to convert those carriers into a more jet, uh, uh, fighter jets uh, aircraft carriers. Uh, uh, but the government is very difficult, uh, difficult uh, politically difficult uh, for Japan to pursue this, and the government is claiming or taking the position that these are not really uh, the offensive weapons because uh, uh, fighter jets would not stay on the uh, carriers all the time. It would be only on a, on a very special occasions they will go in. But anyway, uh, aircraft carriers in the Japanese uh, government's interpretation today are not necessarily a offensive weapons because they don't carry offensive fighter jets all the time. Uh, Japan, which has stick to the principle of, uh, of stuck to the uh, principle of defensive defense, and they find it trying to change it to more active defense. One more m thing about the uh, defense efforts is to increase defense budget. Uh, Japanese defense budget. Uh, is 47 or 48 billion dollars a year. Uh, it is increasing every year, little by little, for the last seven years. For the Japanese, uh, in the Japanese political point of view, it is very amazing, impressive, that the government is increasing defense budget every year. Although the rate of increase is rather limited, very small, Compared with uh, China, China spends about uh, 
six times as large, uh, uh, me, four times uh, as large as Japanese defense budget. Uh, the United States spent about 13 times as much as that. Uh, Japanese government is also interested in developing a defense uh, ex a space program for defense, defense purposes and also use cybersecurity uh, technology for counterattack purposes as well. There are many other things, but I got interest of time. I would uh, skip this. Uh, compared with the China and the United States, Japanese defense budget is very small. But this is the seventh consecutive year, as I said, uh, and it's politically very significant. I would also like to mention a little bit about the Japanese interest in the. Uh, not here. Uh, no, it's there. Uh, coordinate efforts. Uh, what that means is to, uh, in the past, cybersecurity issues or space defense uh, are separate from the uh, air, uh, land, uh, and, uh, and uh, water, uh, marine uh, forces. But they want to more integrate uh, the defense system. This is also new efforts to make our defense system more effective, uh, and uh, hopefully that would work. Uh, and finally, I would like to mention a little bit about constitutional revision. Uh, constitutional revision has been an issue in Japan, Japanese politics, for many years, many, many years, from the uh, 1960s. Uh, but it has not changed. It has re remains unchanged for so many years. But today, Mr. Abe wants to uh, make a greater efforts to change the, uh, rev uh, change the Constitution. Because the Constitution has no reference, reference to the self-defense forces, and therefore lots of arguments about the role of the uh, self-defense forces uh, if there is a clear uh, statement on the, about the self-defense forces in the Constitution, the uh, controversy on this issue will be uh, dissolved. And this is what the Ms. Abe wants to do. And also, it is, I think, important for the Japanese defense because if you could uh, uh, knock out any controversy about the defense issue, uh, self-defense forces. Uh, that will be putting more efforts on our part to strengthen our uh, actual defense issues. Uh, nonetheless, it is very difficult to change the constitution today. Uh, well, today, when they, in, the, uh, difficult in the past as well. Today, we have a two-third majority, in both in lower and upper, upper house. So, uh, according to the uh, constitutional uh, article, it is possible uh, for the government to uh, go, go through the discussions in the diet to bring about the change. But then, uh, today, there are many other political uh, issues that have greater priorities, and then the division is very difficult. And I would suppose that the Mr. Abe may fail again in revising the constitution. And that means it will be a long time before uh, actual revision may be uh, uh, accomplished. Uh, the coming decade will be very critical for the security of Japan and the United States. That we should keep the balance of power in the region to our favor. Uh, I would say the alliance is a cornerstone of Japanese defense policy. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We have uh, 
20, 30 minutes for questions, so if you could raise your hand. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for being here today. Um, I'm a master's student at the Ford School of Public Policy, and my question was on the uh, U.S. pivot to the Pacific that was announced by President Obama in 2012. And considering what uh, the pivot to the Pacific announced by uh, the pivot, President Obama's pivot to the Pacific policy, the rebalance to Asia. Oh yes. Um, and considering U.S. involvement in the Middle East and increasing operations in Europe. Just considering uh, U.S. increasing operations in Europe over the last, you know, five, six years since Ukraine happened, um, how is the U.S. pivot to the Pacific perceived in Japan? Is it perceived as ineffectual or, or not having the means to actually support the objectives it's trying to get after in, in rebalancing U.S. forces? Well, Mr. Obama talked about, uh, as you said, you know, uh, rebalance uh, and uh, putting more forces in, in efforts in, in the Asia Pacific. But in fact, he did not do so much. Why he did not take really actions uh, against the Chinese uh, activities in South China Seas? And, then, um, uh, and the, uh, Mr. Obama did not really take actions against it. And therefore, the Chinese started to move more forces into South China Seas. Uh, therefore, uh, I would say uh, Mr. Trump has done a great, greater job. Uh, he believes in this uh, strong America. In fact, Japan also likes to see a strong America. Therefore, in that sense, uh, despite many counter criticisms, uh, about uh, Mr. Trump, uh, you know, uh, TPP and other issues. Uh, in terms of Japanese defense, uh, we tend to support uh, Mr. Trump because he believes the strong America. And I think he put more efforts uh, in Asia than in, in Europe, I understand. Taking forces from Syria and so forth, you know. Hi, um, Professor Nishihara. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Elon, political uh, science uh, doctor candidate. Uh, I have a question on uh, a detail you mentioned. Uh, you said that uh, the Japanese uh, government is uh, sometimes approaching the Russian government um, to probably see some uh, places where they can cooperate. And then uh, there are news reports that you know China and Japan. Uh, you know, starting to talk with each other. Um, I think a lot of these uh, initiatives are uh, inevitable, given the fact that um, the current administration of the United States is really America first, which means um, the relative importance of its allies is uh, less considered, uh, not just for Japan, but also for Britain and EU. Um, so in that case, uh, I feel it's important that Japan is hedging uh, with uh, more coordination with other countries, not just the United States. Um, but then the thing is that if you approach Russia, that will probably um, you know, alienate yourself from the United States to some extent. So how do uh, Japan balance this tension, which is at on, on the one hand, you have to you know, uh, work with more countries, but then on the other hand, you have to strengthen the alliance relationship with the United States. Yeah. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, Japanese uh, policy toward the Russia today, which is uh, to solve territorial issues, strengthen the relationship with, uh, with Russia and so forth, is inviting some concern from, from the United States, where Japan is going so far. Uh, but in my view, that current efforts on the part of Abe to strengthen, or I should say warm up relations with Russia, may not really go well. So, uh, and of course, the uh, relationship, alliance with the US is a primary importance for Japan. So uh, Abe will be very careful in doing this. And uh, I, hope, I hope he will not be uh, manipulated 
by Moscow uh, to put the Japan as a very difficult corner. Um, uh, my name's Lewis. I'm a PhD candidate in the aerospace engineering department. So you mentioned briefly about um, Japan pushing to compete technologically as a defense initiative, particularly in space. Um, historically, both in the U.S. and Japan, space endeavors um, have been largely civilian-led. In recent years, not just in the Trump administration, I should note, there's been a push for certain technological initiatives to be moved from a civilian sphere into a military sphere. Has there been a similar initiative on the Japanese side to take previously civilian research, for instance, into space planes and hypersonics and move it into a more secretive uh, military research environment such as the National Defense Academies? I think that, that would happen, but it must be, must be very slowly because we need a more defense specialists who are working on the space. We don't have any. Uh, so I think although the interest on the, on the part of the Japanese government is to try to uh, get involved in, in the space uh, defense issue, uh, I think it will be uh, some time before we can really do it. For example, we don't really go on like the U.S. case, but the sp using a space for attacking other countries, so forth. That, that's not likely to happen, but rather a using the space for defense communications. That sort of thing it can happen uh, more, is can give you a, a larger priority. Uh, thank you for coming, sir. Uh, my name is Yu. I'm currently a junior studying political science here. My question would be, what do you think would be the possible response and the best response of Japan if there is a military conflict between mainland China and Taiwan? What can we do? Can Japan do? Yeah, like what might be the best response you expect, yes. and what might be the possible yeah. response? Several scientists in Japan are debating among themselves what can Japan really do. Uh, first, so as we often say, our constitution does not really permit Japan to take immediate actions uh, unless Japan is really attacked, uh, and the tensions in the Taiwan Strait would not really. Uh, justify Japan's involvement, direct involvement. But as you see in the pictures, Taiwan is so close to the southernmost southern islands of Japan. Uh, archipelago in the southwest is, is so close. The, the most south, southern island is, and, and you can see Taiwan on a clear day. Uh, so. Suppose Taiwan uh, pilots, uh, fighter pilots, after they're uh, fighting with the Chinese counterparts, and they may like to uh, escape for safety, uh, they may seek to land in the Japanese islands. Then what do the Japanese can, can Japan do? We can we de deny, de refuse it. Uh, lots of discussions. But I think it uh, it will be a, it'll be uh, sometime. But it may be possible for Japan to say yes. Uh, legally, Japan can do it if it's for defense, because after all, Taiwan is so important for the Japanese defense. Uh, please. I guess one more question on the subject of um, the conversion of the helicopter carriers to carry the F-35 um, jump jets. Uh, the U.S. uses aircraft carriers um, very specifically as a projection of American power and presence into different regions of the world. Um, I'm curious how the Japanese government, you've mentioned them saying, well, they're not always going to have fighter jets, but how are they trying to square the constitutional imperative of the self-defense force with the fundamental military presence projection aspect of an aircraft carrier? 
Yeah, that's a very challenging issue for us. And how, how do we justify this? But I will say this, our Japanese defense policy, basic attitude is changing. As I said here, from def defensive defense to active defense. Therefore, Japanese, uh, uh, let's say, F-35 on, on the deck of uh, aircraft carriers may not really, uh, cannot really go and fight, but it can be defensive. In the active defense, uh, that we can justify the use of uh, F-35. So as a, a follow-on to that, so this move towards active defense is a, a policy of the current majority government. You mentioned they do have a supermajority. Is there much ability for an opposition to that policy to have any effect, given the current power of the government? Well, I, I, I think so, because Although the government has a majority in the diet, the opposition uh, can be very strong. So the government has to fight over uh, that, that issue. Uh, today, Abe is in a very strong position, so he can carry it, but then a strong opposition to that may actually weaken his leadership in, in Japan. So it's a very sensitive issue for us. Thank you very much. Um, so one thing I think you didn't mention um, about the, the rivalry between the U.S. and China is probably about the nuclear capabilities. And and given so so um, so given so so I'm curious about like what the what Japan or the Japanese government think about how they will be will respond to. Um, the rivalry, the, the nuclear rivalry between China and the U.S. and and maybe in particular, given the withdrawal of the U.S. withdrawal from the INF Treaty, is there a possibility of the kind of a Japanese version of a dual track uh, decision? No, Japan has not go to that stage yet. Uh, we do debate, of course, but it was not. The, 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 probably the best what Japan can do at this moment is to increase our uh, intelligence activities, see what, how the Chinese nuclear programs are developing, what are the impacts of the uh, nuclear programs for the security of, of Japan or the Pacific and so forth. So we, we do study, I'm sure we research on those issues, but do we go also nuclear and uh, to, to, to balance Chinese nuclear power? No, I don't think we can go that. Other questions? If not, I'm just going to ask a few questions. Um, the, uh, economic relations are always lurking behind military, political, diplomatic relations, and I'm wondering if um, and people argue that economic interdependence often prevents breakout of war, and others point to some examples from World War I, World War II, to present uh, uh, as a as counter evidence that, that that doesn't necessarily work. So um, China and, and the US, China and Japan, the economic relationships are very much uh, intricate and right, uh, interdependent. How does that, and, but then there's the uh, sort of manufactured trade war between the US and China. How is that changing that calculus, and uh, how might that affect mm -hmm. uh, in the next 5, 10, 20 years uh, the military tension between US and Japan on one side and China on the other side? Uh, and the second question is um, cybersecurity, and um, that's becoming increasingly important in the defense apparatus. And that's one issue. I don't. I don't have a deep understanding of the, the legal ramifications of this in terms of constitutional prohibition in Article Nine. But that seems like one area where Japan could actually get into uh, and s still circumvent the Article Nine prohibition because it's about something in the cyberspace, not in the actual military theater. Um, so I'm wondering if you could comment on Japan's efforts in that regard and what uh, possibilities might lie lie ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, let me start with the second question first. Uh, Japan has also changed, the government has also changed the interpretation 
of the limits of the use of cybersecurity for for defense. In fact, the uh, government recently has said that the counter cyber defense is is uh, legally accept acceptable. So we will go into that. Uh, otherwise, if there is a cyber attack uh, against Japan and then we cannot do anything, that's very strange. We have to defend it. So th th that's more justifiable. The question about the first one, uh, trade war between the U.S. and China, and uh, how Japan is involved in. For many years, we thought if the countries are interdependent, like the U.S. and the United States and China, there will be no war. But in fact, the kind of tensions we see today between the two countries seem to suggest that it's almost possible for the two countries to do some kind of fighting in classes in the future. Uh, in that sense, we are changing the, the, the interpretation or implications of uh, inter economic interdependence on the against uh, military clashes. And I am, in, I'm inclined to believe that there will be some clashes, armed clashes between U.S. and China, in, in the South China Seas, Taiwan Straits. I think we should. Be prepared for it. all of this, United States and Japan too. What, how do we uh, react to it, respond to it? As I said today, 2021, 2049 it will be a very important uh, political target for China. And then I don't believe that China will, will simply go away, uh, would uh, disregard these, uh, these years and uh, leaving the uh, uh, country uh, ununified. Uh, so, so I do think there will be some kind of clashes in the future. That's not something I would like to see, but uh, I'm afraid that may happen. Yeah. I take one last question. I don't want to end on that, uh, that note. <laughs> so sorry. Anybody? And I'm going to ask a question anyway. Okay. So can, uh, can you talk about constitutional revision, uh, the prospect of that happening in Japan? And a lot of people say, well, the mood has changed. And uh, some others say, well, there's still um, allergy on the part of the Japanese public about revising the right, uh, amending constitutional, especially Article 9. And um, you know, Prime Minister Abe would really have to risk his political life. But at the same time, his term is running out. So maybe he's actually prepared to take the risk in the uh, next couple of years to really push forward on the constitutional revision. What do you see coming? Well, uh, I think you're right. But this year, in June, we have upper house elections. The result of the upper house elections may be that uh, uh, go governments are losing votes. Therefore, two third majority may not become possible, may not remain possible. Uh, if that should happen, then we can't we have to postpone the constitutional revision. Uh, if, if Abe can introduce the bill for constitutional revision before June this year and get it approved in the, in the parliament, in the diet, then it may become possible. But there's only a few months it's now four months, so it's now in June. So I don't think that's possible now. Uh, that's how I feel. And uh, that's very unfortunate uh, from those who like to see the revision. Many people who support Abe feel strongly that constitutional revision should be done during the time that Abe is a prime minister. Uh, uh, the, the, in that sense, it's becoming very difficult uh, for actually uh, to accomplish that revision. Okay, please join me in thanking Professor Nishihara for the wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.